Welcome, welcome everybody to Redacted on this uh, Tuesday. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And on this show, we cover the stories the mainstream media largely ignores. Mainstream media largely ignoring the story or spinning what happened to uh, the hydroelectric dam uh, in Russia, which has flooded an entire city and potentially killing thousands. We're still trying to put the pieces together of this story, but the Western media seems hell-bent on blaming Russia for it. They... I guess, you know, just like the Nord Stream pipeline. So we're going to uncover the very latest details on this story. They are sort of asking questions without asking questions. Yeah. Um, it's a really annoying way to read headlines because you're not supposed to draw any kind of logical conclusion for yourself. Just sort of you follow them down this, you know, leading question and then yeah. they're not going to answer it. It's crazy. What if we parented that way, like in our house? Like ask questions without asking questions. Yeah, this is this is one of the things that like always causes fights with spouses is like, don't ask a question that's not a question. If Clayton asks like, so are you going to, you know, pick up those things, you know, at the dry cleaners later? And I'm like, do you want me to? Don't ask a right. question that's not a question. You can ask me to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> you learn these things as a married couple. This is how to not fight with your spouse. Don't exactly. ask questions that aren't questions. Yeah. Please pick up the stuff at the dry cleaner. That, that's more direct or just, you know but that sort of passive aggressive like are you gonna you know yeah, yeah. give me your statement for yeah. the for the visa this week yeah. <laughs> so, anyway familiar. we're not also, gonna fight in front of you <laughs> are you gonna use that bow flex out in the gym that i bought you for christmas <laughs> Yeah, that's hanging, it has clothes hanging all over it. Good question. Uh, Dan Cohen is also going to be here because Ireland, uh, you know, has decided here's the way to combat global warming. We're going to kill all of your cattle. Yes, Irish farmers revolting. Sound familiar? Sounds like the Netherlands all over again. Irish farmers saying, don't even think about it. You're going to kill all of our cattle in the name of climate change. So we'll talk about that. Uh, plus, how do you feel about the government putting a camera in your home to watch everything you do? Um, yeah, sign me up. So you can, it turns out there's a high correlation with people who are A-OK -okay with that. And people who are A-OK -okay with central bank digital currencies. Hmm. Um, we're going to talk about who are these people? Do they need a cautionary tale? Yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk about that data because young people are surprisingly like, sure, put a yeah. camera in my house. Watch me. That's fine. Uh, also, UFO story. Big UFO story. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. We've got a very special guest on the show today. Is this a big psycho uh, psychological operation? This big bombshell uh, UFO whistleblower Pentagon story that has unfolded over the past 24 hours. Uh, we're getting more details about who is behind this and how it all unfolds. All of that and more as Redacted starts right now. say in the chat it's a false flag this ufo story we'll see we'll see what it is or are you talking about the um the the, the hydroelectric dam there's so many false flags these days we can't even keep track of them but or we try the camera in your home which probably is already yeah. there it's true <laughs> uh but we try to keep track of all of it in the daily newsletter and it's so easy to subscribe to our free newsletter just go to redacted.inc not.com put in your email address and sign up and what do they get it's a great uh, newsletter. you get a daily newsletter it comes every morning that this show comes to you monday through thursday and it consists of a lot of the things that we talk about here, plus more stories. It's a really good way to seek out links to the things that we are talking about, because obviously this is a video platform. We're not texting each other links, but I do text you those things through the newsletter, and I try really hard to put in original sources so that you can find to your, for yourself, save them, share them, that kind of thing. Um, we are not ever trying to lead you to any kind of conclusion about anything. Sometimes we may present you with our conclusions, but we want you to have original source material so that you can decide for yourself. And uh, we always appreciate your subscribing to the newsletter. It's free and your comments on the newsletter too. Redacted.inc is the place to go. Um, hey, right up on the screen, we have a new rebel that just joined. Um, welcome to the rebellion, Sylvia. Nice to see you. Hey, and Sylvan. 
Oh, Sylvan, sorry, I turned away too quickly. So we're trying, we're on our pay pace right now for 2 million, almost 2 million subscribers here on YouTube, almost 400,000 on Rumble. We're really trucking along on Rumble. So hello to all of our Rumblers, but uh, we're at 1.938070. So if you subscribe during the show, your name will pop up here on the oh, big, like that. big redacted board. Sid Ranajib. And uh, then the numbers should switch. I think we'll see them go up um, as you subscribe to the show. Uh, so thank you guys so much. We're, we're live every Monday through Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. All right, let's get to the news, shall we? Uh, today is June 6th, 9th, uh, 2023. Um, 79 years ago this morning, uh, in the early morning misty hours uh, off the coast of Normandy, France, a little known operation called Operation Overlord, uh, started. The operation had one singular mission, to liberate Europe from Nazi Germany, to accept the unconditional surrender of Hitler's forces. That was the ultimate goal of that morning and what unfolded over those many hours. And then, of course, for days plus, all the way through June, all the way up until the end of June, um, this invasion of Normandy happened. The operation delivered five naval assault divisions to the beaches of Normandy, France, and it became the largest amphibious assault in world history. It's unbelievable to see these pictures now and to think what was happening on that misty, stormy morning when air cover wasn't even available in the way that they had planned. So all of these men uh, storming these beaches without the air support that they thought they would have as they took on all of these Nazi pillboxes, uh, raining hellfire down on them. It was the largest amphibious assault in world history. You might know it by its other name, D-Day. So on this day, it is worth honoring these men. In the first 24 hours, 9,000 Allied soldiers were killed by Nazis. Between the Allies and Germany, we saw more than 550,000 casualties during the invasion of Normandy. I mean, it helped turn the tide of the war, of course. The massive Soviet victories in the North pushed the Nazis out of Stalingrad and ultimately out of Russia altogether. These combined forces and combined victories defeated Nazi Germany. It's worth thinking about this, though. Like, on a night like this, isn't it? This is, I mean, 79 years ago today. Imagine what those men were dealing with on the beaches of Normandy. 79 years ago, the people that gave their lives, the people who lost limbs. Uh, now we have... Uh, we're in this era now where NATO is actively supporting the very evil that we defeated 80 years ago. Unbelievable. And if you think about it, there's nothing more dangerous than someone who is losing power, right? We talk about this a lot. Yes, absolutely. The, the idea that, what is it like a, if you're losing power, that's when a person lashes out. Yeah. Right? When you're taking their person, a, a person's power. And we are watching the last desperate throes of Zelensky's regime trying to hold on to power. You be the judge. If this is what's if this is what happened after what happened overnight, overnight, Ukraine and NATO forces partially destroyed a hydroelectric dam. They might as well have destroyed the whole thing because at this point it doesn't matter. Uh, this hydroelectric dam in the Kherson region. This is what happens when you destroy a dam. Just look at that. Thousands of innocent people die in their towns. Just look. I mean. It, this is unbelievable drone footage of what happened. It really is. It's shocking. I just, I can't imagine. No. I mean, there's... Well, I think people underestimate the power of water. I mean, there's nothing that is going to stop that water. No no man-made structure will will stop that water, other than the one that was there. But you know what I mean? Like the houses, the... It's no, just, they're, they're all floating it's down the... Yeah. Gone, it's powerful. And they're all floating away now, right? So they partially destroyed this dam and just destroyed this whole area. Um, here is some more daylight footage, um, as you can see uh, here, of the uh, a wall of water flooding the city center. Uh, and now it's completely flooded after NATO and Ukraine partially destroyed this hydroelectric dam. And according to the regional governor, hundreds of civilians, hundreds of civilians were in this town before NATO and Ukrainian forces flooded the town. Um, and so we know that that was the case. And that's, the, you know, hundreds of them. Um, you know, look at this damage this morning and look at these roads are now rivers. Look at this house is just floating down the streams, floating down the river. Uh, that's just post apocalyptic. It's unbelievable. Now I lived in West Virginia during 200 year floods back to back in Bluefield, West Virginia, when I was there as a young reporter. And you just saw these entire communities devastated because of this. And this is like 10 times worse than what I saw in West Virginia. 
like what, a, what we're looking at here and the size of that river overflowing. So when you look at these drone footage, the water, the water flows downstream of the, of the Dnieper River um, and just absolutely destroying this entire area. Horrible, horrible. And again, the governor is saying, we can't even enter this town in the Belgorod region, saying we can't even enter this territory because of the nonstop shelling. Um, this is, you know, this is other areas that are just under nonstop shelling in civilian areas. Um, Patrick Lancaster in this area today in Belgorod region, like dealing with a nonstop shelling in this area. So this continued attack on civilians here is just to give you a sense of where this flooding is tracking here. I've drawn in these blue areas here near the dam. So you can see these areas that are just totally underwater that have just gotten flooded according to local reports. Um, here's a map. Now just take a look at this map and you can see here uh, where this, this area in question. So this is the area in question here, right near here in the center of your screen near this dam. And then as, um, you can see all of this area here under underwater, all of that city center underwater. But then look as we pan up further here on the screen, where does it go? Up river a little bit, up river a little bit here. And just further north, further north is the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant and, and the town of Zaporozhia. So right here, this water, of course, is incredibly important to, to cool the nuclear power plant. Uh, and the cool water from that area is being used in that. So look how close. And of course, the continued shelling of the Zaporozhia power plant has uh, continued. Remember, and just think about what you're looking on your screen here, guys, is a Russian city. Right? This is a Russian city. Ukraine is claiming that Russia blew up the bridge, blew up the dam. Even the head of NATO had the balls to tweet this out today. Look at this, guys. This is Jen Stoltenberg, the head of NATO. The destruction of the dam today puts thousands of civilians at risk and causes severe environmental damage. This is an outrageous act, he writes, which demonstrates once again the brutality of Russia's war in Ukraine. So, and also Olaf Scholz of Germany also came out and accused Russia of blowing up their own dam. This is the same Olaf Scholz who shouted down, was shouted down as a warmonger this weekend. Um, even had people taking the speech and cutting it into clips with him and Hitler back and forth, back and forth. And people were shouting, you're a warmonger, you're a warmonger. And he was trying to speak louder than them because, you know, because he was, he was basically sounding like Hitler. Um, but wait a second. I seem to remember NATO and Ukraine testing out the idea of blowing up this dam last year. It was even featured in the Washington Post. The idea was to stop Russia from advancing. So this was in the Washington Post, where they specifically highlighted Ukraine using HIMARS launchers to attack this dam. You cannot make this up. Kovalchuk considered flooding the river. The Ukrainians, he said, even conducted a test strike with HIMARS launchers on one of the floodgates of the dam, making three holes in the metal to see if the river could be raised enough to stymie Russian crossings, but not flood nearby villages. The test was a success, Kovalchik said, but the step remained a last resort. So we're not going to do it just yet. Washington Post has a feature article about how Ukraine was planning on blowing up this dam to slow a Russian advance. It's amazing how this all comes together, doesn't it? I think like almost like hoping we forget that this was in the Washington Post. So they already told us they were going to do this. Just like when they told us they'd blow up the Nord Stream pipeline. And then they did it. And then they tried to blame Russia, even though Joe Biden told us he was going to. Victoria Newland told us that they were going to. So in addition to blowing up the dam, just up the river, of course, is that other target, which is the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. I mean, again, this river is vital to the cooling of the nuclear power plant. It's been under constant shelling by NATO forces for the past year. Um, we found HIMARS shells being used to attack the, the nuclear power plant, which has been under control of Russia since March of last year. And they've been using HIMARS to attack all over this area. But don't worry, the Atomic Energy Agency says, hey, the IAEA says nothing to worry about here. It's all fine. We've got it under control. Listen. Today... The uh, Nova Karhovka Dam was severely damaged, 
leading to significant reduction in the level of the reservoir used to supply cooling water to the ZNPP. The cooling water is required for the essential cooling uh, systems which provide cooling to the follow, among other to the following. Residual heat removal from the reactors, spent or partially spent fuel there. Residual heat removal from the spent fuel ponds. Cooling of the emergency diesel generators when they are running. Absence of cooling water in the essential water systems for an extended period of time would cause fuel melt and inoperability of the emergency diesel generators. However, our current assessment is that there is no immediate risk, risk to the safety of the plant. Okay. We are following this by the by the day. We're following this by the day. <clears throat> Great. So just like when they <laughs> when they went to Zaporizhia last fall right. and said, we can't say who's doing this, but we can say we don't want it to happen anymore. Right. We can clearly see the azimuth of these rockets and where which direction they're coming from. And they're coming from the West. They're coming from Ukraine um, and they're using American high Mars to attack the power plant. But we can't say who's. Who's yeah. actually attacking the plant? We can't. We who, just who can't come out and say it? <laughs> yeah, we, so, hmm, who do you me, think did it? I mean, that's so, so hmm. Encyclopedia Brown, who do you who do you think uh, stole the lunch money from little Wendy? Like, who did it? I mean, one side has images that they show on the internet. Right. With, like tracking numbers and serial numbers and things like that. But I guess that's not really a clue. They shouldn't ask to see that because... It's a hanging chat or what have you. This afternoon, well, this Ukrainians were posting videos of themselves saving dogs in the river. Like they're like Ukraine's like, yeah, because Russia blew up the dam. And literally there's like a police chief that's like filming himself or filming his buddy. at this police officer pulling a dog out of the river and saving the dog's life. It's like, great. That's great. Thanks for thanks for your hard work. After you blew up the dam. Now you're trying to save face with propaganda on the Internet. Go ahead, David. Yep. Well, I was just going to say, if you read Twitter, you'll see that pop propaganda works because people are blaming Russia. And like you said, they're saying, wow, Russia's blowing stuff up. Ukrainians are saving dogs. Exactly the same thing I was, I was just going to say that I <laughs> yeah. saw. It's just like unbelievable how much it's propaganda amazing. works on online. Yeah. See, these Ukrainians are saving dogs after they blew up the dam. Well, the same thing happened just a few weeks ago at that hospital in uh, Dnieper which was uh, hit by when a Ukrainian anti-rocket anti missile hit another missile and it fell on to a hospital. Zelensky got out something in front of that story, mm -hmm. said that it was Russia, even though it was Ukraine that knocked it down into their own civilian areas, because we know yeah. that they are not cautious around civilian areas. Um, and the, the comments were completely, you know, just absolutely um, sycophantic uh, on Zelensky's Twitter page. like. Yeah. You're so brave for saying this. You're so glad you're saying this. Russia's the devil. All of that kind of just believe it and fall in line. Yeah. And then if you question it, you get shut down. Like uh, our friend uh, who then covered it got his like channel shut down for it, for actually telling the truth about it. So you can't even talk about it because they'll, they'll block you for it. But hey, don't worry. Um, because on this D-Day, this 79 years after D-Day, the United States is standing for, for democracy and will continue to send money to the bastion of democracy, which is Ukraine. Um, and what we find is that American members of Congress are really read up on this war. You would be surprised, actually. I was stunned to see this. Um, you might not know this, but American members of Congress, they're so well, they read more books than Natalie and I do. When We read a lot of books. They are so read up on the Ukraine war. They know every little nuance of what's happening. They understand the history since 2014 of Crimea and the Donbass and how it's been uh, hell for the people living in that part of the country and why they voted to become part of Russia. These members of Congress understand all of it. It's unbelievable. Here, the gray zone caught up with representative. This is Congressman Jamal Bowman, who from New York. Uh, so you think New York, very cosmopolitan state, right? Clearly, they're going to know. So he was on the streets of D.C. when the Gray Zone caught up with him and to ask him about the nuances of this war and why we're sending so much money to this uh, this regime. And here's what he had to say. It's unbelievable how well read he is on this. 
What do you want us to discuss? The Donbass in Crimea. I don't know if I know much about that. I need to get into the details and learn some more about that. Yeah. Do you, you know what those are? Uh, no, tell me. What? Educate me. What, well, let me ask you this. What, what's your opinion on the, the war for Ukraine? Do you support U.S. aid to the war in Ukraine? Uh, yes. Why do, you, why do you support that? Because Putin's a madman and uh, we got to stop him. But uh, I'm anti-war in general. Okay. All right. But, all right. but so just so you know, the Donbass and Crimea, those are the central regions in Ukraine, uh -huh. which were in dispute and which started the war over those regions. Okay. So. Okay. Good to meet you. If you say so. Cool. Good, good to meet you. D Donbass, Crimea. I don't know too much about that. I have to read up on that. I don't know what that is. I don't know what those are. I never heard of that before. I mean, Putin's so a why, why did Russia go in there then? Why are they there? He doesn't need to answer your questions. He's a well, member madness. of Congress. He's a member of Congress who then, you know, then provides the purse strings for the, the defense contractors to make billions of dollars. He doesn't need to know the nuances of this. He doesn't need to need, need to know why the people of this region have been facing a genocide since 2014. And this is what this was all about. I mean, Crimea like that at least was in the news. The Donbass, the Western media goes out of their way to ignore. But right. Crimea at least was a you know fun talking point for Obama for a while, for a long while. To, right. Uh, stir well, up anti-Russia hate. <laughs> There's a reason people like him get tons of funding to get into office. Oh, my God. That's the kind of people they want yeah. in there. It made me want to cry because I think about, you know, these journalists that spend time in this region. They know that the Western world is ignoring the abuse that they have been experiencing for nearly a decade. Um, and even when journalists come there, uh, there's one in particular who said that when we go there and we say we want to show the Western world what's happening to you, people in those regions kind of shrug their shoulders and say, no one cares. No one's going to listen. Everyone's just going to hear what you know, Ukraine is saying to the West. Yeah. And this is why this, this just shows that, you know, ignorance works. It, it works and it's incredibly expensive. Can I, I want to watch that soundbite again. This is an unbelievable, I've watched it like five times today. I cannot believe that this is a member of Congress who the house of representatives controls the purse purse strings. It made me want to cry to mm -hmm. see it because you think about, wait, 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 people are dying and you are this flippant about it. Right. Putin's a madman, you say. And, well, and that's, that's what I was going to say. The, the Putin is a madman is the argue, is the same tactic as calling somebody a racist in an argument. Like, I don't have to, if I, if I, you know, like, like, uh, what's the word you're always using? But like, justify uh, or? like if it, yeah, re, if it's so reductive that I'm just like, well, I don't have to have this conversation with you. Like, we don't need to know why, because yeah. Putin's a madman. That's it. You yeah, Putin's a madman. You don't, you don't need to, to question go. it. You don't need to question it. How about how about explain how Putin is a madman? Can you explain it in detail with evidence? Well, I'd love to hear it. Please explain. Um, but here it is again. I just want to watch this again. It's so unbelievable. Jamal Bowman. What do you want us to discuss? The Donbass in Crimea. I don't know if I know much about that. I need to get into the details and learn some more about that. Yeah. Do you know what those are? Uh, no. Tell me. What? Educate me. What, well, let me ask you this. What, what's your opinion on the, the war for Ukraine? Do you support U.S. aid to the war in Ukraine? Uh, yes. Why do, you, why do you support that? Because Putin's a madman. And uh, we got to stop him. But uh, I'm anti-war in general. Okay. All right. But, all right. but so just so you know, the Donbass and Crimea, those are the central regions in Ukraine, uh -huh. which were in dispute and which started the war over those regions. Okay. So. Okay. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah. Thanks, Grayson. <laughs> so great. Uh, unbelievable. Good to meet you. I don't did, have any ideas. Did you... S no. Did you see the follow-up video that was the second one in that thread that was posted that was, he caught him on the way out too and kept it going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He keeps asking him. He's like, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> I, I didn't. And he's like, call my office. Just call my office and we'll, we'll work together on it. We'll work together. We'll fix this together. <laughs> we'll stop Putin together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so uh, yeah, the West, the, the Western narrative right now is that uh, Russia blew up its own dam. They blew up their own bridge, the Kerch bridge to Crimea. They blew up the Nord Street pipeline. Um, Man, Putin, you know, Putin's really a madman because he they keeps really blowing like up his own stuff. Own equipment. Yeah. yeah. He keeps yeah, blowing like up his people. own stuff and it's killing like, his own people. It's like Putin doesn't understand scorched earth. You don't uh, like go into another country and then burn your own. Yeah. That's, that's not how scorched earth works. Right. Yeah. So, I'm, 
We've got more news to get to here on your Tuesday. Um, and thank you to Ricardo who, R Rivera, who just became a subscriber. If you subscribe, your name pops up here on the big screen. Um, we're going to talk with Dan Cohen here about Ireland. The Irish farmers are in revolt because there's a proposal to have them kill all the cattle or a huge portion of the country's cattle in order to stop climate change. Where have we heard this before? And we've got an, an exclusive interview uh, with a former FBI agent uh, who is calling a little bit of BS on this UFO whistleblower story out of the Pentagon. He knows a lot of the players. He's written books on this. He was the original uh, FBI agent on the X-Files, actually that the X-Files TV show is based on. John D'Souza is going to join us um, here shortly on the show. That's exciting. But first, we want to tell you about our friends over at Shopify, because you know that sound, the sound of another sale on Shopify, and the moment another business dream becomes a reality. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Now, whether you're selling or uh, looking to open an online platform for selling, Shopify simplifies online selling and in-person selling so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Uh, for example, if you wanted to sell uh, crystals that you were fine in your backyard or you want to sell um, any of your like things that I like to buy for the kids, like little book stamps that say this book belongs to, let's say that's the kind of thing you're into, or friendship bracelets, what have you. Shopify covers every sales channel from an in-person point of sale system to an all-in-one all e-commerce platform e-commerce platform and even lets you sell across social media markets like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. So it is your turn now to get serious about selling and try Shopify in today. It also powers the redacted store. So if you're interested uh, in seeing how we use Shopify, it's wonderful. You can sign up now at shopify.com slash redacted. You can sign up for a $1 per month trial. Um, it's a trial period. Again, that's shopify.com slash redacted, all lower, lowercase. Again, once more, go to shopify.com slash redacted to take your business to the next level. Well, the World Economic Forum wants you to stop eating meat. We've already seen what they've done in the Netherlands, taking away 3,000 farms from the Dutch farmers, maybe the, the meat bread basket of the world. Um, just look at any of the menus and items that you order, and most of it comes from the Netherlands. Well, probably not for much longer. And now Ireland is getting in on the action. Their plan to combat climate change is to kill thousands of cattle so that the methane doesn't go into the atmosphere. Is that the solution? Redacted correspondent Dan Cohen is following this story out of Ireland. Dan, good to see you. This is more, more climate madness. Exactly. Clayton, the Irish government is considering wiping out 10%, an entire 10% of Ireland's cattle herds, which adds up to about 65,000 cows per year for the next three years. Now, it's still a plan. This is not etched in stone. It's from a Department of Agriculture modeling document, but it is under consideration. And the government insists that farmers and ranchers who would lose their cattle would actually be compensated, and that this would be a, quote, retirement exit scheme. In other words, to phase out cattle ranching altogether. So unsurprisingly, farmers, cattle ranchers are not taking kindly to this news. The Telegraph reports that Irish farmers revolt over plan for cattle coal to meet green target. It doesn't go into detail about what that revolt means, but if uh, the Dutch farmers, uh, if it's anything like that, then we might see um, some, some serious action uh, in Dublin. But the article does quote Pat McCormick, the president of the Irish Creamery Milk Suppliers Association, who says, we're the one industry with a significant roadmap. And to be quite honest with you, our herd isn't any larger than it was 25 to 30 years ago. Can the same be said for the transport industry? Can the same be said for the aviation industry? So his point, the cattle industry is exactly the same as it has been for decades, but it's the one being targeted. The CEOs of major companies aren't being told to fly less in their private jets. You know, billionaires aren't being told to, to dock their yachts. Um, so this would cost, this calling this cattle would cost 
200 million dollars or I'm sorry 200 million euros annually which is about 214 million dollars so the government basically wants to spend taxpayer money in order to destroy food sources that are economically productive and as you said all of this is in the name of stopping climate change there's a belief some might say a, stu a superstition that cow flatulence flatulence which contains methane is causing the Earth's atmosphere to warm, warm. So regardless of where you come down on the climate change debate, whether it's actually even happening, let alone what might be causing it, the fact is that the vast majority of emissions that its proponents are saying heat the atmosphere are not released in Ireland or even in Europe or the United States where these kinds of policies are being implemented but in Asia, where most of the world's population lives and where development is occurring. Just look at China, which emits the most carbon in the world, and that makes sense considering it has the largest population in the world. Of course, Ireland doesn't even show up in, in the top 10. So even if you believe, yeah. believe that the climate is changing because of carbon and methane emissions, destroying the cattle industry in Ireland will do absolutely nothing to reverse that but it will definitely destroy the livelihoods of many farmers and ranchers and make meat more expensive. It's absurd. I mean, we've been covering the green hysteria here on the show for, a, you know, for many, 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 many years. And, you know, just going back to my college days, being forced to read all of the different Paul Ehrlich books and all of the, uh, the, the you know, the population bomb and the world is ending, of course, as a result of all of this. But what these, what these green policies don't take into account is, of course, the new methane that's been introduced into the atmosphere, the new changes that humans have created through this green radical movement, which is all of this, these green composting. So all of that compost creates methane and that methane is new. This is new in climate, uh, you know, in climate research. So now we have all of these piles of compost because of this green movement and animals have been around, ruminant animals have been around for tens of thousands of years. Think about North America being covered in buffalo right? This is not new. Cow flatulence, animal flatulence is not new. So getting rid of 65,000 cows in Ireland is not going to change anything. Exactly. And this is just, you know, the, the ranchers fear that this is just the first step for them of being phased out entirely. So then Ireland doesn't have any kind of productive cattle industry. Therefore, it's less, less sufficient, self-sufficient. Its sovereignty is gone. And these are the steps that the billionaire World Economic Forum class is taking to destroy uh, countries and, and make uh, people um, uh, unable to take care of themselves. And so then, you know, we see under the same agenda of combating climate change, we see JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, uh, you know, Epstein buddy, calling to seize private property in order to bend, build solar and wind farms, this gigantic industry. That's another uh, being pushed through under the guise of we have to save the planet from human and animal activity. Um, so all of this predicated on, on the idea of a, of a climate crisis. I think back to uh, when I was in Haiti last November, and we were reporting on this showdown at the fuel terminal in, in Port-au-Prince because the government raised fuel prices on some of the poorest people in the world and so the idea is, well, they have to starve in order to save the planet. They can't, you know, get to work. They can't get to school. I mean, there's the Extinction Rebellion activists shutting down freeways here in D.C., preventing working class people from getting to their jobs. There's, of course, the activists who are uh, uh, throwing paint on, uh, on fine art and museums, which is obviously extremely unpopular. Climate change has been floated as a reason for more lockdowns which of course did incredible harm to uh to to you know the the lower classes during uh, uh the covid era so i mean it's obvious that this is a very broad agenda a multifaceted agenda and there's a lot more in store well as alex epstein writes in his great book fossil future it always adversely affects the poorest right and so we as an industrialized country or the industrialized european union had thousands of years of growth and were able to use fossil fuels and were able to use coal, were able to use things that brought us to modernity. And 
then we look upon these countries who haven't yet been able to industrialize in that way, and we tell them, you have to skip that step. Or holier than thou, you have to skip that step and go right to solar and wind. And we now know the data, it would be, it's impossible for you to supplement an entire society's energy needs through solar and wind. The data is irrefutable. The, almost the entire United States would need to be one giant battery in order for that to work. Almost everywhere you look, I think 70 or 65% of the entire United States would have to be a battery. It would be just one giant warehouse in order to store the amount of energy needed to sustain 330 million Americans. So it doesn't work. It's a lie. It's a failure. And we're asking these people to give up their livelihood for a total lie. When are we going to face the reality? I'm not asking you to tell us when we're going to face the reality of this, but these politicians are have bought into this hook, line, and sinker because the follow the money. You mentioned Jamie Dimon. You mentioned these people that are making billions of dollars off of solar and wind uh, and all of these industries, which are now being, of course, given grants and all sorts of money from the federal government. The Build Back Better program, the the Inflation Reduction Act, which was just one big massive boondoggle for the for the energy industry, for the solar and wind energy uh, and renewable energy space. It's a total lie. And, I, you know, just it's so frustrating to hear that these poor farmers, they're being given a retirement package. Like, you don't want your cows anyway. You just want to retire and go down to the pub, watch some football. You don't want your cows anymore. It's 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 so insulting. It's really insulting. Yeah, and they're not honest with them anymore. You know, if you look at what the government says to these to these cattle ranchers and farmers, they just say, oh, you know, we're just going to phase you out and you're going to be it's going to be voluntary and you're going to be, you know, given a uh, you're going to be able to retire nicely. But the whole idea is that there won't be another generation of ranchers. So these I mean, there's also traditional lifestyles that go along with that. Um, and then an, an entire industry just just wiped out and. You know, I mean, of course, we all know what what a Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum has in mind for us with eating bugs. Uh, so got to wonder is getting rid of cattle, getting rid of the ability to eat meat, which uh, provides um, important nutrition for people. Uh, is right. that is that what this is really about? Yeah, it's about that's exactly what it is. And it's about, you know, it's about the money. It's about making money. It's about getting rid of these farms so they can build high rise apartments get rid of the meat so that where they don't make any money and they can replace it with solar and wind energy uh, and make, make money. That's what this is. Always follow the money, follow the money. Dan Cohen from Washington. We appreciate you following this story for us. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. And I was just reading and Kit here in the chat was just saying too, like when, when Dan was just talking there, he said, uh, you know, cobalt lithium mining, like if they really want to crack down on something, like, instead of going yeah. after cow farts, maybe you should go after the cobalt mines in Congo. Oh, my goodness. I, um, I mean, corresponded like <laughs> with the author of cobalt, uh, Red Cobalt, Sidhart uh, Guerra, and he said he would come on the show because I finished that book last last week. And it's horrific yeah. uh, what we're doing to certain it, economies for this in the green revolution in order to make these green vehicles. It's, it's absolutely devastating. Go ahead, Philip. Oh, I was I was going to point out that like all of the they could they could take all of the farmers in the Netherlands and all of the farmers in the Ireland just completely get rid of them to to stop global warming and that's not, still not going to come anywhere near to someone like Nestle and the damage they do to like worldwide. Yeah. So it's like they're they're focusing on definitely the wrong people. Yeah. And they know they are. They the know individual farms. So it's all about consolidation of power and money. Yeah. yeah. Let us know your thoughts on that in the comments below. And uh, hey, if you subscribe to the channel, your name will pop up here. And yes, it seems like we're under technical attack. I don't know. So we apologize. But anyway, go to youtube.com slash redacted news and on Rumble as well. Rumble.com slash redacted. We've got more news to get to here on your Tuesday. Do you want the government putting cameras in your home? Yeah, the U.S. government floating this idea. Like how many of you would actually be up for this? And to actually have cameras put in your home by the federal government so they can, you know, keep track of you and also protect you. But it's all under the auspices of protection. Would you be game for that? Plus, we're going to be talking about this UFO whistleblower story. John D'Souza is going to be joining us here in a few minutes to talk about this bombshell Pentagon story. Uh, we'll get to that. But first, we want to tell you about uh, private Internet access VPN. It's so important, guys, right now in this crazy world where you want to get online. I mean, I use the VPN every day for our job. We wouldn't be able to do Redacted without a VPN. 
because these governments block, block you from watching content. I had a viewer write to me in Canada saying they couldn't get our newsletter anymore because the Canadian whatever section of Canada was blocking their access. And she wrote me back and she said, sure enough, when she launched her VPN, she was able to get access to it once again. Isn't that crazy? Yes. Like This is the kind of censorship we're seeing right now. That's why our friends over at uh, Private Internet Access are taking care of us right now. And you can get uh, an unbelievable 83% discount for trying them out by going to piavpn.com slash redacted. You've got to check out Private Internet Access. Do you guys know that over 30 million people have signed up for them? piavpn.com slash redacted is a leading VPN provider that works with all major streaming services. You can access more content than ever before in the world. All you have to do is connect to a server and you're good to go. It's all so easy since private internet access offers fast servers in over 80 different countries. I personally use it and I like to connect to Iceland. Iceland has some of the best uh, privacy protections of any country in the world. So I like to, I log in, I do my surfing from Iceland. Thanks, Iceland. Yeah. It's amazing. Like, You've never been in Iceland. I've never been to your Iceland. your anthropomorphized mouse has been. Yes, my computer browsing and when I get my news sources and things that I need to get that I can't get in the EU or the United States. Thank you, Iceland. But anyway, I do that through private internet access and I'm able to do that. It's great. So again, get 83% off, just $2.03 a month. You get four months completely free. Go to piavpn.com slash redacted for a truly private digital life. So the governments stay out of your business. piavpn.com slash redacted. All right. Well, would you be okay with the government installing cameras in your homes? Uh, what if, okay, that sounds horrifying, but what if they said they were going to do it to reduce domestic violence, abuse, and other illegal activity? Oh, oh, you mean because it's going to protect me now? Oh, that's what it's about. It's going to yeah. protect me. Like if I beat oh, you up, me if up. you beat me up, if I decide to start beating you up, the right. government will stop it. It will right. protect you from these guns. Well, I, got, I got the cameras <laughs> on and you're beating me up. And then like the government shows I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm, I was actually, thanks government. I was actually into that. Um, yeah. What, what if your food portions are too small? It's like, Hey, you're just not feeding me enough. I like, thought of that. that hey, you're right. eating well meat. Enough. Are you eating meat, David? David eats like a steak every four, four, four and a half minutes. Like the, they'd have a camera in your house, you cooking a steak saying no way. Well, this is something that the Cato Institute is actually studying, um, for there's a reason not just to freak you out. Although it freaks me out. Uh, the reason they're studying this is because they see a correlation between people who are A-OK -okay with central bank digital currency and people who don't mind this kind of government surveillance. Because the link they're making here is that these two things are not that far off. Because a central bank digital currency would be able to track how much money you have, when you make that money, what you do with it, what you're allowed to spend it on, all of those things. Um, we're going to talk about that more in a second. But let's just talk about this private thing because it's interesting to think that there would be a generation a population and a generation of people who would give the government this power sort of happily i suppose uh, now this is from the cato institute they do tend to be an institute that's related to libertarianism small government and uh big freedom type research in general so at least we know who we're dealing with right well, yeah, center right but they also take a huge amount of funding from the Koch foundation the Koch foundation and the Koch brothers of course helped found the Cato just so yes so okay and so you can see that you know where their bias may, may or may not lie um but here's how the survey overall shakes out overall three-fourths of people oppose government surveillance in their homes take a look at the chart 14 percent are in favor of this <laughs> 10% say they don't know. So they're not really bothered by even the very question of governments installing cameras in your home. And they literally did just ask it that not in a way that's like, you know, couched in any sort of way. I mean, think about how that would have panned out for COVID if you had uh, gone to visit your grandmother or, you know, two people went to the store instead of one or what have you. Um, yeah, they say it in the headline there surveillance camera would you be okay 
opposed to installing government surveillance cameras in all homes. Right. Now, I, when you I want to interview five people from that 4%, 14%, just five. I just I just have some questions. Me too. Yeah. Like what is wrong with you? <laughs> um when you parse this out by age group, look at how the data plays out. Uh young people are overwhelmingly more okay with cameras in their home than older people. After people hit about 45 years old, the reporting plummets to 6% or fewer of people who would say okay to cameras in their home. I, I assume that those older people are just people who are afraid of falling and then no one around to help them. Um, but look at how almost 30% of young adults between 18 and 29 say that they are okay in favor of government surveillance cameras in their homes. 20%, that's one in five of people between 30 and 44. Uh, when you break it down by party and race, this is also interesting. So if you look at, these are just people who are in favor of it. More Democrats than Republican by a margin of just 3%, or uh, uh, by a margin of 6%, rather. Um, far more black people are okay with this. What? Which is interesting because... 33%? If you think about this idea that you are not safe from the government because the government is harder on black people than any other race, why would you invite them into your home then, the one place you might feel more safe? Uh, gender is not that significant indifference and age we went over. Uh, and then if you look at the political bent, the ideology at the bottom of who would be okay with this, more liberals and moderates um, than people who are very conservative. Now, again, why are we looking at this? Because the Cato Institute thinks that these opinions are, in fact, related to how people feel about central bank digital currency. And when they overlap this data, take a look, they show that people who are in favor of in-home surveillance cameras also support CBDC um, as opposed to people who oppose it and, uh, and also oppose CBDC. Um, so they found that more than half of those who support the United States adopting a CBDC are also supportive of government surveillance, suggesting there may be a common consideration that is prompted by both issues. They say likely it has to do with the willingness to give up privacy in hopes of greater security. Or my my take on it is that maybe it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how much power that CBDC will actually give the government uh, because the Cato Institute points out that a CBDC would establish a direct line between consumers and the federal government, like straight through the banks. They have everything right. There's no gatekeeper anymore. They don't have to subpoena banks. They don't have to ask for statements. They have it. They have it all themselves. Um, you know, once consumers, I think, really understand that and the idea of even like ephemeral money, you, you use this money for this and nothing else. Uh, these are your privileges for money. I think CBDCs will be a harder thing to sell because they quote a Pew Research study that shows that people really do not trust the government to do the right thing. I know this is shocking. Uh, this is how many people are reporting that they think the government will do what is right, just in the sort of existential definition of what is right. Uh, back in the 60s, the government had a high level of trust. In the 60s and 70s, uh, what do you think this thing is that made it plummet into the 80s? Vietnam? Yeah. Korea? Uh, how about the uh, JFK uh, assassination? Yeah. Uh, RFK assassination? How about uh, Martin Luther King assassination? I'm just looking at this chart up in the sky here. Uh, yeah. Uh, and this renaissance in the 80s is maybe, you know, Star Wars and the Cold War, and the Reagan administration, plummets in the 90s around the Bush administration, uh, Iraq War, that kind of thing. September, well, recession. Yeah, big recession there, right. of course. Yeah. Um, September 11th, maybe, you know, it, it comes back around to this sort of good, feel good trust of the government and then precipitously in decline ever since um, and then declining yet again since the COVID-19 pandemic. So this tracks, I would say, but even right now, 20% of people, according to this chart, trusting the government to do the right thing, that feels very high to me, but that I'm not a representative sample because I study news all day and I feel like 
that's naive. Um, maybe that's why the Cato Institute found that just most people do not feel good about a CBDC. If you overwhelmingly people feel 67% negative, uh, 21% neutral or unclear, only 12% positive that a CBDC do, will be something good. Go do ahead. they cite their sample demographic and everything anywhere to, to know where they're pulling? Like, are they still using the old telephones to call no, people they're for this not. stuff? No, they're not. They're not. I can't recall. I did read it, but I can't recall off offhand of their sample. They do claim that it's representative because you see the age group um, and the ideology uh, that it represents a, a good mix of all of these attributes i think the, a lot of the big gotcha. polling companies have now moved away from just the traditional phone because they they realized that the numbers were so off so rasmussen um all of these polling companies now heading into this new election i think we're going to see this is going to be an interesting question we're going to see a sea change in like polling coming up here during this next election cycle it's going to be a difference really it'll be interesting to see the numbers this time around what? See how accurate they yeah, are. Yeah, because you can't randomize it. You, you can't randomize it without something like the telephone where you can just reach out to everybody yeah. at random. Right. Like, yeah. well, if you can't randomize it, your sample, your sample is already contaminated statistically. Because yeah. if, you, if you're just going to the mall to interview random people, you're only you're only getting the opinion like a like a, 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 a statistical analysis of people that go to malls. Yes. You know, and that's just it. That's, yeah. a, that's a great point. Yeah. And if you yeah. put it up on your Internet and you have people come by your website you know, who's going to the, you know, wherever they're surfing, then they're going, they're seeking out this website and they're also on the internet. Yeah. And, you know, the, yeah. The, a, a truly randomly representative sample is almost impossible to get. Mm. So you always have to account for that um, in statistical analysis. But my sentiment is that these are pretty accurate numbers. That's sort of how I feel as I move around the internet. But let me know if that doesn't feel like your world. If you feel like, no, people want this and people trust the government. Uh, I would love to know. Um, and you know, my take on this generational gap, if you, can we go back to the first chart? Is that easy for us to do? Or the second chart with, with the age gap is just a simple, I hate to say this because I come off as like a, you know, well, kids just don't know, but I do kind of feel like kids just don't know. <laughs> Like, if you spend you your know. whole day on TikTok, you know, and you're shooting videos of yourself, like, uh, you know, in, in a bikini, you know, on TikTok and you're posting it and you, yeah. you know, want the you want the approval of your friends and you're constantly on a phone with a, you well, know. What they're asked is, again, if we could just leave that chart up, is it OK for the government to put cameras in your homes for the idea of protection, like reducing a crime and, and abuse? Um, I think young people are likely to say, and I might have felt this way at one point in my life, like, well, I'm not doing anything bad. So sure, yeah. watch me. That's fine if it protects other people. I think that these people don't that haven't gone through any kind of ideological crisis where, or maybe they haven't read Edward Snowden's book, or maybe they haven't thought about like how the government will use this against you. And so it's just a simple naivete. Uh, either that or maybe high schools don't, assign 1984 anymore and people are no longer thinking in terms of government control um i was thinking well have they watched the hunger games because that is a yeah that's a government surveillance cautionary tale maybe right. they can think about that like even in the hunger games i can't remember if there are cameras in the individual homes but they definitely do not talk about things they're not supposed to inside their homes because of you know the access to the key peacekeepers so you don't even i don't know you don't even need fiction you can literally go back to covid lockdowns where where you know the police forces and different were spying on your people's homes to make sure people weren't leaving their apartments or doing other things or they were wearing their masks or their movement or they were forget even just like physical tracking they were tracking you with your cell phone data. We know this now. We know that the CDC yeah. was working and was physically tracking you with your cell phone data. So they were already doing this. Now they just want to put a camera in your home. We don't even need to go to fiction in 1984 and Hunger Games. And the way that now government narratives spin this, like these things are for your own protection, makes me extremely uncomfortable because they can spin anything like that. Like if you think critically about, you know, vaccines, this is for your own protection. We're going to stop you doing that, saying that, thinking that, reading that. Um, if you are overextending your carbon footprint, this is also for your own protection. If you are uh, anything, we can, we can think of a million cautionary tales because globalists are telling us what they want to control. 
in terms of our money, our movement, our thought process, our research, all of that stuff. Um, you know, let me know how you feel about this, why you think there is this big generational divide, why you think young people are more okay with this. And maybe young people, tell me what I'm missing here. I'd like to know. All right. Well, we've got more news to get to on your Tuesday. We're going to sit down with John D'Souza, a former FBI agent, to talk about this UFO story and this UFO whistleblower. What does he know from his FBI sources and whistleblowers that he's dealt with over the years? What smells fishy about this whole story? Um, or uh, is there not any fish smell at all? Not fishy at all. I have fish on the brain today because I took her over for a walk um, down by the ocean. Yeah. And he got into like a fish that was there. Mm -hmm. And he was like playing. It was dead. But and then he came back smelling like fish. So he's need, he needs a bath. That's now. the worst. Does he like roll in it and everything? Yeah. Why was he? Why was he doing that? I was like looking over. And he's just like rolling. And I'm like, what are you? You're rolling on like a what the hell's happening? Fish? Yeah, fortunately, yeah. you know, anyway, but it was on like a, a rocky cliff, so he couldn't really do it, but he wanted to. I'm like, yeah, how often do you want to go roll in a dead fish? Anyway, love my dog, but I, I can't. If I could talk to him, I'd love to know what the hell he's, what the hell he's thinking like, What do you that. get out of that? I don't know, so I got fishy. I that? got something fishy on the brain today. Uh, but first, it's no secret. If you're tuned in, then you know experts are predicting a recession right now, and the decline of the U.S. dollar is real. I just did a whole video on what we're seeing with the U.S. dollar. They're spinning all of these unemployment numbers. It's like sunshine and rainbows, and and uh, and that's great. And the eurozone inflation is dropping a little bit. But underlying all of it is the debt crisis, is the amount of money that the U.S. government owes. And because of inflation and because of interest rates, that's how they are going to get out of this mess is by trying to devalue the U.S. dollar, devalue the currency. That's how you get out of having to pay these massive, these massive loan debts that the United States has now. The only way to do it. All signs are there. We could be in for a United States currency bear market for the next five years, three to five years for the U.S. dollar to be in the toilet. So if you've got your family's finances like sitting in a savings account somewhere where the U.S. dollar is losing value every day because of inflation, um, you need to think about maybe taking some of that. If you got a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, or something sitting in a savings account that's losing money, think about moving that over into precious metals. Uh, that's what Natalie and I have done. Absolutely huge part uh, part of what we invest in, and our friends at Lear Capital can help you get set up with it. It's so easy. The phone number is right on your screen. Just call these guys. They'll give you a free gold kit to see if it's a fit for you and your family, so you can sit down and talk about it and decide: Do I want to buy gold and silver right now? Silver is the is the play, my friends. Natalie and I just bought a whole bunch of silver yesterday. Did we did we do it yesterday or earlier this morning? Did it go uh, through earlier this week? Yeah. Yeah. So we just yeah bought a whole bunch of silver because silver prices uh, are just oh they're perfect right now. Um, and gold is down a little bit too, but man could be hitting all time highs by the end of the year. Anyway, call Lear Capital today one 3557 or go to the website learredacted.com. Get your free gold and silver investor guide and just talk about it with your family and sit down and look at it. Hey, can we move some of this money, which is losing value, into a precious metal, which has sustained itself for 4,000 years and hasn't lost its uh, purchasing power in 4,000 years? But every government currency in world history has collapsed. So why don't you try it today? 1-800-613-3557 or go to learredacted.com to learn more. Again, our friends at Lear can help you get set up with buying precious metals delivered right to your door or put in storage. Well, a Pentagon UFO whistleblower has come forward. David Grush is his name to say that the United States is in possession of vehicles of non-human origin. That's a uh, government speak way of saying alien vehicles. In other words, the United States has alien vehicles in our possession. Watch. When you say crash retrieval, what do you mean? Uh, these are retrieving non-human origin uh, technical vehicles. You know, call it spacecraft, if you will. Uh, it's probably not the right parlance, but uh, no kidding, non-human, exotic origin vehicles that have either landed or crashed. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. 
Well, John D'Souza is a retired FBI special agent who served for 25 years on the counterterrorism and paranormal cases. He had a top secret clearance during that time, during his time at the FBI. In fact, D'Souza literally collected the real life X-Files that were used in the show, The X-Files. He has a lot to say about this UFO whistleblower story. John is here. John, welcome back to the show. And you have the distinction, my friend, of for our audience that recognizes John, you and I, the interview that we did is the most watched interview in the history of Redacted of this channel. So thank you very much. Over 2 million views right now on this on this uh, video. Thank you, John. Wow. Thank you, Clayton. That's, uh, that's owing to your skill and expertise as an interviewer and on this subject, too, which you appear to have extraordinary knowledge on. So, yeah, I'm very happy to be with you again. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure to have you back, and our audience would, was very excited to have you back on as well. So this story breaks over the past few days. Now, immediately in my heart, right, because I, you know, I'm a kid at heart, I, 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 we've known all of this. If you knee-deep in this literature for many, many years, it, it seems obvious to us who follow this that the United States has had otherworldly vehicles for decades. This is not new news to people like you and me, people in the know um, who've been tracking and following this. So we hear a UFO whistleblower from the Pentagon comes out and says this, and it sends shockwaves around the world like, oh my God, we're hearing from the Pentagon for the first time. My little spidey sense goes off and I immediately think psychological operation? Like, why are we hearing about this now? When you heard about this testimony and you heard about this whistleblower, what were your first thoughts? Can you tell us the truth here? What, what is going on with this story? My first thoughts were what, what I really know personally. And it's about many whistleblower complaints from FBI people. Uh, going back many, many years, uh, I've had, I've had um, involvement with these people, uh, going back all the way to a um, uh, counterterrorism whistleblower named uh, Sybil Edmonds, uh, another one uh, named uh, Robin Gritz, uh, and including the modern whistleblowers that we have uh, today, uh, FBI agents Garrett O'Boyle, uh, Marcus Allen, Steve Friend, all of whom were were stripped of security clearance and, and fired uh, from the FBI. So what my first thoughts were extreme confusion, confusion from seeing uh, David Grush's uh, interviews and the things that he uh, the things that he's going through because it just didn't fit the mold of most whistleblowers. For instance, uh, I just don't see, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank David Grush for his service to this country, which is a very important and very honorable thing. Uh, however, what's going on with this uh, complaint is just bewildering because I, first of all, what is the basis for his uh, whistleblowing? Uh, for instance, all of the uh, FBI whistleblowers, the basis for their complaints is the weaponization of the FBI against civilians, against right. civilians, right. which is right. highly illegal, highly illegal, improper, unethical. I mean, it's, it's, that is the basis for a whistleblower complaint. And all of these people have suffered enormous uh, uh, punishment and retaliation, and they've been fired, they've been persecuted, uh, they've suffered extraordinary things. I'm not even clear from David Grush's uh, uh, interviews, um, what was the retail is he even working anymore for the uh for the government i i can't tell uh because he doesn't really address this and, and that goes to another point uh real whistleblowers have something called uh righteous rage they have righteous rage because they've been persecuted they've been uh they've been wronged tremendously and, and i don't i don't see that with david so you don't Rush buy it you don't buy it in his his video responses, um, yeah. he's, he's, is it something about his interview that it was standing yeah. out to you? And because he filed yeah, well, this complaint saying there's government suppression here, there's government suppression of these vehicles, and he's coming forward to be the person that's going to tell us all about this. Right, right. But that's not, that's not an illegality. That's not a, a, an actual legitimate basis for a whistleblower complaint. The government is always allowed 
to not share information with the public. That's otherwise the the entire national security structure couldn't couldn't function. That's that's one thing that I see as extremely problematic. Also, why can't I find the de unclassified version of his whistleblower complaint? I I looked for it everywhere. It's it's not out there. And it should, if this was a matter of public interest, like the whistleblower says, that should be released. That should be released. It should be available for everyone to have. Um, but the other point is that he, I would invite people to go to uh, News Nation now to see the full interview, which is astounding. It is astounding. I have never seen such a gushing, gushing softball interview from the uh, supposed journalist who's at that site uh, doing that with with uh, David Grush. Uh, it, it actually just seems much more like a the beginning of a publicity tour. That's what it really looks like. This so publicity guy, tour, with another way to say this, psychological operation or is not, no, this is not a psychological, would you think this is a psychological operation? You're shaking your head. Well, it's it's part of a, a, of a I believe it looks like it's part of a much larger psychological operation. And so what happens in these things is that they get they get a lot of people to work for the psychological operation unknowingly. They don't even they actually believe what they're doing is is right, is correct, and that it needs to be done. Um, they have um, many people who are working for this uh, psychological operation, including including congressmen and senators, US senators who are trying to get in on this because it's just it's just extraordinary. So one thing I would I would ask um, for uh, the people who are pushing uh, David Grush forward is that they need to have him answer some real questions from a real journalist like maybe a Whitney Webb uh, to actually come forward in order to give this any legitimacy because I see all the comments everywhere I go uh, they just they just don't believe this people the regular people so like like your audience yeah i mean we have a lot of people in our audience who are saying this looks like a psychological operation when we covered it last night i said this is well, this was one of the first alarm bells for me psychological operation the idea that uh let me just unpack this a little bit do you believe well what he's saying at the basis is true that the united states has all otherworldly vehicles in its possession that we are reverse engineering like that that part is true correct well truthfully yes i i actually do believe that that's true uh i i do believe but uh i have a hard time believing that he's a part of it that's uh, the part i'm having a hard time with i see because I see, I see. right he's not telling us anything i mean even in that that segment that you showed I, this gushing supposed journalist is just asking him, yeah, so you're saying that we have pieces of this, of these vehicles and we have actual vehicles themselves. How many? And he's just like, uh, a, a bunch, mm -hmm. a bunch. It's like, what you know, if you're, if you're what a real tough questions, boy, John, I would love to hear you with all of your knowledge in this subject. What would you specifically ask him? If you were sitting down and we gave you a camera with David Grush, what maybe give me five questions specifically that you would ask him. Okay, then I'll have to pare it down. Uh, but yeah, you have first 10, of all, you have 20, I, yeah. <laughs> give me yeah, give me your five best. Uh, my five best, I would say, um, I would say, first of all, what uh, you said, non-human origin, technical vehicles. I, I would first of all, I would say, what is a technical vehicle? I I don't know that. Maybe uh, maybe somebody here is an engineer or something, and they know what a technical vehicle is because i have no idea what that means uh that would be my first one uh second um uh, non-human origin so are you are you saying that uh the uh stuff could have been made by monkeys by apes by intelligent apes i mean if you mean alien visitors why why wouldn't you say that why wouldn't you just say that um second of all uh you said these are these are spacecraft these are spacecraft use that that word um how do you know 
these vehicles are from space. Uh, we're finding out now that a lot of UFOs, genuine UFOs, are actually from inner Earth. They're from beneath the oceans. They're even from volcanoes. So is there is there some other basis of knowledge that you have that tells you these things are from space? That's mm. one of the questions I would ask. also and, and have you been on one of these craft to know that? Um, do, you know, Dr. Well, Michael Sala is reporting on this. We, you know, have you been on one of them? Have you traveled yeah. to the moon base, the secret space programs, yeah. sp space? Well, uh, you know. that's, that's another, that leads to another point. If you see the full interview, well, fuller interview on uh, newsnationnow.com, uh, uh, if you see this, the, they actually, in the full interview, they actually seem to admit that it, it looks that way, that, uh, he has actually never personally seen these pieces or these vehicles himself only in pictures it appears ah. only in picture i mean that's devastating and the uh, journalist who was interviewing him appears to bury that at the bottom of the interview because the journalist is actually feeding him feeding him questions and then here's the other point about that as well is that uh it, it really raised my suspicions when this individual who's being again he's being fed these uh it's almost like he's being reminded of these answers by the journal the journalist who is interviewing him in this puff piece uh over at news nation now and one of the things that really stuck out to me is that in this entire uh in this entire psyop there's a cia phrase that they all use sorry they all use and they it's a it's a cia phrase because it's a psychological operation phrase that implies alien visitors but doesn't directly say it but it triggers all the neurons in our in our minds that associate with alien vehicles and it's this they are and the, and this whistleblower did it too um he was fed the line to say that says uh that says quote yes this means that we are definitely not alone in the universe and there's a lot of, and they look up meaningfully at space supposedly when they say it and, uh -huh. they, and they, they've all done this they've all done this and it's it's unbelievable because it's the exact same wording so what is at the heart of this psychological operation for me let me just give you my my cynical view which is Yes, of course, we have otherworldly vehicles. We've been reverse engineering them for decades. We have this. We That's know true. this. It's absolutely 100% the case, right? We know this. Now, they're trying to create a boogeyman because we need another enemy. We want to, the deep state wants more money spent on the Space Force and an expansion of our military into space. Mm -hmm. And that's the psychological operation that we need to create this enemy, this sort of benevolent, the, these, these benevolent beings that have been here sharing technology with us, as Dr. Michael Sala reports, and even his brand new book on this exact subject. We've been collaborating with them for decades. High level members of the military have been collaborating with them for decades. Now, suddenly they're an enemy. That's the psychological operation. That's the way I see it. Am I wrong or right? That's exactly right. Um, you know, what's funny is I actually, uh, last night I saw uh, your wife actually say what this really is, I, I think by accident, because uh, <laughs> she's been around me too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's exactly this. Uh, she said, uh, she said, I only am concerned about things when it shows the global governance coming together with the military industrial complex. That's exactly what this is and that's why this movement has so much power so much power so much resources behind it and uh, and they may possibly be doing what we used to call in the old uh, in the old days we used to call it triangulation triangulation uh the uh the clintons actually made this into an art form where they would actually control their their advocacy but then they would also control the enemy as well the supposed enemy and they would have both sides fighting against each other, supposedly fighting against each other, but then actually both sides would actually be working towards the same goal. And I think that we may possibly be seeing that here as well, where we have the whistleblower who's, you know, he's, he's kind of failing to show that righteous rage that all whistleblowers have, uh, but he's gonna, he's probably gonna get better at that. 
It's going to mm. get better at that. And uh, that's what we really need to see, uh, because this is a very, um, this is possibly a very scary uh, uh, merger of global governance, which has control of all of these UAPs. They have control of all these UAPs and the military industrial complex, which wants to bolster itself. They haven't had, they haven't had any wars in a long time and they need to bolster this, to get this going because the uh, Russia Ukrainian conflict, it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't really go anywhere anymore. And uh, so they need this, they need this for their resources and for everything that they're doing. So that's why we're going to see this operation continue and it's going to get worse. And we may get, we may get more uh, whistleblowers on this as well. Uh, but um, we'll see if they do a better job than uh, David Grush has been doing here on this. So well, we'd welcome him on the show. I'd welcome David here on the show, and I'd love to answer, you know, ask him these tough questions here, right here on Redacted. We'd love to have an open audience. I'll, I'll have him on for an hour. We'll do a whole hour special with David, and we'll dive deep. And there won't be any uh, kissing, kissing of the ring or anything like that. Oh, we'll be uh, straightforward uh, questions. <laughs> so bottom line, you think that he's being manipulated, he's being used, um, and he doesn't fit the mold of, a, of, a, of, an, of an actual whistleblower like the ones we saw testifying before Congress a few weeks ago. Absolutely. And I would also I would also ask him, because I've known a lot of these whistleblowers in the past, uh, how did he how did he lawyer up with the original Intel community inspector general as his attorney? So his whistleblower complaint is being examined by the office of inspector general. But at the same time, he actually got a former inspector general to be his attorney. If you, if you know any of, and he is completely lawyered up. I mean, I would, uh, I would not be surprised um, if uh, they start suppressing anybody talking about him. Uh, but um, he, this is, this is unprecedented. If you know any whistleblowers uh, in real life, uh, like these FBI whistleblowers, they have a very hard time even getting a private attorney to uh, represent them because the private attorneys all say, all say, no, this is the government. This will be too hard. It's going to be impossible to do. So a lot of these whistleblowers, they don't have any attorney uh, uh, representing them. And this guy got an actual attorney from the agency that is evaluating his whistleblower complaint at the same time. It's like, how? Great, great point. I'll get you out of here on this, John. Another thing that stood out to me last night was we learned that, of course, he had to run all of the, what he was going to say. He had to run it through the Department of Defense. He had to get approval to release this information from the Department of Defense. You know, having written books, you have to get approval from the FBI. You worked at the FBI before you release anything. In the same way that Jack Carr, who wrote the terminal list, used to, you know, to get all of his books approved. You know, he has to run them through the CIA and the CIA redacted different parts of his book. And you literally are reading his book and there's redactions. But they, right. the Department of Defense, allowed him to come forward with this information. They signed off on it. Does that pass the smell test, or that's weird to me? Well, it begs the question. Then, what is it that he revealed to be the the basis of his whistleblower complaint and retaliation? It's like, ah, if he's right. if he's getting the approval and the encouragement of DOD to <laughs> reveal the stuff that he's revealing, then what was the basis? what what originally happened i mean these um these the real real whistleblowers they suffer they always reveal something without permission from the government and then the persecution that they suffer is unbelievable i would encourage people to go look at the uh the whistleblower complaint of uh this uh fbi this fbi uh agent uh garrett o'boyle who uh was who was so persecuted uh, by the FBI, who was transferred from one jurisdiction to another uh, with his three kids in tow and a new baby. And then in the middle of their move between jurisdictions, the FBI advised him that he was his security clearance was revoked. He had been fired and he was not even going to get his goods back from the moving company the FBI had hired. And so he was literally homeless him and his family were homeless without anywhere to go and without the ability to get their goods back because that was real retaliation against a real whistleblower i just do you have to look at these things to figure it out 
Great points. All excellent points. John, always great to see you. Don't be a stranger. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. How can people, uh, you've got books, how can people connect with you online? Uh, people will just go to something, uh, johntamabooks.com, uh, and uh, they would uh, go there to uh, find my uh, book, The Extra Dimensionals, where I actually explain what, uh, what these extra, what real UFOs are, where they come from, and um, why it is that the government can't shoot down UFOs, that they're not 57 Chevys with pieces coming off uh, <laughs> that, are, that are just crashing all over the place and just being dead by the side of the road. That's not what this is. This technology is so far ahead of our own. It is not, it is not a 57 Chevy. People have to, have to realize that. And that's why I wrote my book, The Extra Dimensionals, so people can actually see what real alien vehicles really are like. John D'Souza, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, Clayton. Great being here. Wow. Well, thank you, John. And uh, thanks to all of you for subscribing to the channel and being a part of our great community here. I love the fact that when we cover these stories and I see in the comments, like I'm reading the chat, it says, yeah, psychological operation. That's how smart you guys are. That's why I love doing this show and I love our audience. Um, you should all go and check out the full interview that I did with John. We did a redacted conversation for about an hour or longer. And it, it is the most watched video we've ever done here on Redacted. because And the comments are amazing. The feedback has been amazing. We deep dive a lot of the discussions that John and I just had here. So I'll link it up in the description um, to make sure you go check out that full interview. Also, while you're in the description, we have our sign up for our newsletter, which again, we'd love to have you sign up. It's totally free. Um, and it's our way to being able to stay in connect, uh, contact with you uh, in case we ever get pulled off these platforms because they like to deplatform people all of the time. So um, it's an opportunity for us to provide a great newsletter for you every morning, first thing when you wake up. You can read it in about five or 10 minutes. We try to provide a ton of value for you. Natalie writes it, works really, really hard on it. And then I add a lot of the little graphics and, and, and headlines and things like that in there as well. Um, but it's a mom and pop operation from us with love sent to you in your inbox first thing in the morning. The way to sign up for it is go to redacted.inc, not .com, .inc. Put in your email address. You'll receive a welcome email. It might go to your spam folder. Uh, if it does, drag it over to your inbox and verify your email. And then tomorrow morning about 7 a.m. Eastern is when we publish the newsletter. So you'll get one tomorrow morning. All right, everyone. Thank you guys for a great show. Thanks for being so attentive and such an awesome audience. And we will be back here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Much love to all of you guys. Have a great night, everyone.